Who is the greatest Toronto Maple Leafs hockey player of all time? It's a question that could prompt a fiery debate among the supporters of Matt Sundin, Daryl Sittler, or Davey Keon. But in my view, there is no debate over who is the most beloved Leaf of all time. Hands down, it's Johnny Bauer. A star goaltender in the American Hockey League, Johnny didn't truly make it to the NHL until he was 33 years old. And he helped backstop the Leafs' last Stanley Cup victory in 1967 while in his 40s. And even more bizarre, his real name wasn't Johnny Bauer. Author Dan Robson details it all in Bauer, A Legendary Life. He is a senior writer and head of features at The Athletic Canada, a sport media instructor at Ryerson University, and he joins us now with the Netminder story. Dan, good of you to spare some time for us. Thanks for having me. This is a good time to talk about Johnny Bauer because, of course, we're just coming up on Boxing Day to the second anniversary of his death. The story for him starts in 1925 in Saskatchewan, but the crazy thing is Johnny Bauer is not even his real name. What's his real name? His, well, his actual name is Johnny Kishkan. So it's something that people didn't know for years. He changed it uh, well into his life um, and basically started this new myth around him that, uh, that was completely sort of created that most people don't know about. We'll talk about how the name change came about in a second, but what was his life like on the prairies back in the 20s? It was tough. It was very tough. Uh, Johnny grew up in a household with um, nine siblings. Uh, he grew up basically incredibly poor, uh, grew up during the Great Depression. Two, two young parents who had a great amount of kids with not a lot of means, um, just sort of scraping to get by. It was sort of a common story, actually, of, of life in Canada at that time, especially in Saskatchewan. His parents, were, his father was a homestead farmer who tried to sort of make it in a new land, um, finally decided to go into the city of Prince Albert and, and try and uh, make it that way. And, had a bunch of uh, a variety of jobs trying to make ends meet. So mm. uh, life for Johnny from the beginning was quite humble. Uh, like most poor kids who wanted to play hockey, you had to improvise for hockey equipment, right? What did he do? Uh, Johnny did a lot of things. We had a branch that he used as a goalie stick, um, and he cut up uh, an old uh, infant mattress that he and his uh, a friend on the street found uh, to make goalie pads. And that was how he sort of strapped, uh, he strapped those to his legs and, and would stop... Uh, frozen pieces of uh, horse manure uh, as pucks. So that was sort of the, the, the beginning days of Johnny, was um, sort of as uh, whatever he could find, he used it to play this game. And the game was really sort of uh, an escape from, from the difficulties of, of life. Well, let me pick up on that, because he experienced something that very few people at the time did, and that was a so-called broken home. His parents split up, which almost yeah. never happened back then. What happened? And this is something that Johnny himself never really spoke about. It was a very difficult thing. Um, that he carried throughout his life. And it was one of the stories that I went back to look at when I was writing this book about him. Because I, I, as a writer, I think that what we become obviously starts in where we began. And, and I think that um, for Johnny, it was something that he held um, sort of privately and quietly throughout his life. But it, in many ways, it had, might have had to do with why he eventually changed his name. Basically, his parents um, split when he was about 10 years old. and. Um, we live in the same town, but it's a very small town. Mm -hmm. So the, the realities of, of that kind of um, scandal at the time, uh, the, the kind of gossip was something that he, uh, he dealt with uh, for the rest of his life. His hockey career begins, his pro hockey career begins with a team called the Cleveland Barons. This is the American Hockey League, so one league below the NHL. He's 20 years old, and suddenly, as you point out, he's not Johnny Bauer anymore, he's Johnny Kishkan. So what's, uh, tell us a little more about what the story is behind the name change. So it, Johnny told a lot of stories about why he changed his name. And it's really interesting, actually. His Wikipedia page still right now is filled with tons of errors. One of them is attributed to me, because uh, previously when I interviewed Johnny, he told me that he had changed his name uh, to his mother's maiden name. Um, that currently on his Wikipedia page, it says that, and it's cited to an article that I wrote. Uh, I've tried to correct it many times, and I, I, they won't. They won't allow me to for was some Kishkan reason. Is, uh, Kishkan was his, his Kishkan was his father's name, but Bauer, Bauer wasn't his mother's his maiden mother's name. last name was Jacobson. So I found that mm -hmm. out after when I started researching the book, and I realized that that was one of the stories that he told. He also told a story about being adopted, um, which was actually one that he used many times uh, in his early career. He spoke about a lot, but um, there was a lot of rumors. So one of the things about Johnny that I found fascinating was he created this this new name, and in a way, this sort of new identity after the war um, when he started his professional hockey career, which sort of separated it from him from his past. How much of it might have had to do with prejudice against people from Eastern Europe at the time? Uh, there's some speculation that there was a lot that had to do with it. Johnny himself 
wasn't the kind of guy who would really speak about that or get into it, but the reality was that it was difficult for people of Eastern European heritage in Canada at the time, and there was a lot of discrimination that I think that we might not be as aware of now that, um, that new Canadians faced and that um, you know Johnny might have faced. There was one story that I was told about uh, the Cleveland Barons um, sort of management kind of saying, you know, you, you might want to change your name because Kishkin sounds a little too European. Hmm. Let's show a picture. Sheldon, if you would, bring up this shot. This is Johnny Bauer as a member of the Cleveland Barons. Look at that old equipment. Look at him. Uh, he got the nickname the China Wall. How did that happen? So the, the China Wall was actually a nickname that came from a sports writer at the time um, that was just in, in, in Cleveland that was writing about Johnny. Johnny's career in Cleveland was kind of remarkable. I mean, his it's hard to imagine, but he's still the winningest goalie in, in American Hockey League history. At the um, And he, he basically spends his most of his career until he was 33 years old playing in what we now know as sort of the minor leagues. Uh, but but Johnny became a sensation uh, in that in that time. And the China Wall was just sort of a, a name that that was given to him that kind of stuck. It wasn't necessarily one that he, he loved, but it was one that kind of held up as you know, this, this, uh, this, this gigantic thing that nothing can get by. Now, as we saw from that picture, he played in an era when goalies didn't wear masks. Yeah. What kind of injuries on his face did he sustain? A remarkable amount of injuries, um, some, some quite horrific. Uh, I, did, I went to some length describing them. I spoke with uh, Nancy, his, his lovely widow, at length when I'm working on this book. And, and she took me through some horror stories of, of Johnny showing up at home with a sort of mangled face. In one instance, he lost a lot of his teeth. Some had been jammed into the nerves of his, um, of his, of his mouth. Um, he required stitches. And, it was just, and she, the, the team uh, brought him back on the bus from Pittsburgh that night to Cleveland uh, and didn't really bandage him up at all. They said, you'll be fine. Wait till the morning. And Johnny, being a very tough man, just said, OK. And, and it, was, it was actually Nancy who said, forget this, and, and drove him to the hospital and then gave the team a firm scolding in the hmm. morning. So. Now, eventually, he gets called up to the New York Rangers of the NHL. That doesn't go too well. Remember, this is a six-team NHL. There's only six goalies in the whole league, so it's pretty tough to crack in. Uh, eventually, back to Cleveland, he wins the AHL Most Valuable Player Award twice, sets the record for most consecutive minutes without giving up a goal, almost five straight games. It's incredible. The Maple Leafs then want him, but he's not sure he wants them. Why not? Right, it's really interesting. I mean, that, that's sort of the part of the story of Johnny's um, personality in a way. He, Cleveland was home for him. Cleveland, although he played in Providence and in Vancouver, and, and he had that, that stint in, in, with the Rangers that you mentioned that actually left quite a sour taste in his mouth. Um, Johnny, at, at, in the end of the day, I think was a guy who loved stability, loved home, loved loyalty. And he was a very loyal man himself. So Cleveland to him, although the bright lights of Toronto at the time were for him and there was sort of an opportunity to make more money and have more fame, he, he wasn't sure that he wanted it. He was quite at home in Cleveland and, and wanted to retire there. He even made a stipulation when he finally agreed to go that if anything happened, he'd be sent back to Cleveland. Hmm. He makes his debut with the Maple Leafs at the age of 33. Yeah. He is the second oldest player in the NHL and so begins a continuous mystery which lasted pretty much till the end of his life. How old are you exactly? <laughs> uh, why did this persist as a mystery throughout his life? It's really interesting. I mean, I think it, I, this is one of the things that fascinated me when I went back and looked at the records. I mean, I went all the way back to the church around the corner from where he grew up that had his baptismal records and found definitively the date of his birth scribbled in, in French um, in, by, by a priest who had baptized him. Um, but his entire life, he'd sort of created this myth around himself. And as it continued to build, the, the press started to write about it. We're not really sure how old he is. It started with, I believe, his um, desire to enter the war, and which he uh, lied about his age uh, several times. So he was I, older than he really was? Yeah, I, have his, I had his war records for the books. I went mm -hmm. through and looked at his military records and, and saw he, he told... Um, different stories about that throughout his life, but the, the records sort of show this sort of lying about how old he was. And that, as it persisted, I think it kind of became part of this myth that Johnny embraced in a way. At age 36, he wins the Vezina Trophy as the NHL's best goalie. He's the oldest goalie ever to win that trophy. He wins the Stanley Cup in 62, 3, and 4. Mm -hmm. And this is really stunning. I didn't know this till I read your book. After Bowers Maple Leafs defeat Gordie Howe's Detroit Red Wings for the 1963 Stanley Cup. We're going to show a picture. There it is right there. What this is immediately after the game on the ice. Describe what happens here. 
Well, I mean, so 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 Gordy actually goes over and and you know puts his arm around his good power. Now they go way back, and this is sort of one of the more fascinating, um, I think, friendship stories in in, in hockey. Two Saskatchewan history. boys. Two Saskatchewan boys that that grew up under similar circumstances, uh, and, and actually ended up summering together at the same. A lake just north of Prince Albert, um, and and at the time Johnny wasn't famous. Johnny was a minor league. He of course was. He was well into his his own legendary career. But they uh, were very like-minded people. They they got along very well. I think it probably had to do with their roots. It also had to do with just their personalities. They they were both very humble men who who cherished loyalty, and the two of them um, just had this sort of incredible friendship that. It was was really unique to see, and at, at, during that, after the game, you know, Gordy comes over and and puts his arm around Johnny, and they do this this interview together, which kind of becomes this classic moment. They do an interview live after the game together. I mean, that's that never happens after losing the Stanley Cup. I yeah, mean, it's a, a, really a delightful, amazing moment. Well, let's talk about another great goalie here, because of course later in the '60s, Terry Sawchuk comes to Toronto, and the two of them win a Vesna Trophy as the best tandem together. And in 1967, of course, they win the Stanley Cup together, the fourth Stanley Cup for the Leafs in the 60s. Johnny Bauer is making $11,000 a year as one of the best goalies in the National Hockey League. Sheldon, bring up that picture here if we can. Look at the two of those guys together. <laughs> they were the team who brought the Leafs their last Stanley Cup 52 years ago, need I remind everybody. Uh, what was their relationship like? It's really interesting because you, you probably wouldn't have two different characters in... in in sort of hockey lore, Terry Sajic was famously, um, you know, mercurial. He had uh, all kinds of um, issues in, in his life. Uh, he died tragically young, um, unfortunately, not long after. Um, and, and Johnny, obviously, being this sort of always gregarious guy that that everyone loved, the two of them were quite different. Even in practice, in the way they played um, the game, uh, Terry would just skate off the ice, and you know, like he didn't want to practice, and Johnny would be there to the very end. But they became good friends, actually. It was tough for both of them being uh, previous Vesna winners in the NHL and, and to be together as a tandem. And it was sort of the first time they were doing this. But because of their age and because of sort of what they they needed to do to get through a season, the, the Leafs and Imlac thought it was a good idea to post them together. They end up being, um, you know, really good buddies. And, and I think it was uh, it's one of the one of the great stories in hockey is sort of that that unique bond that they shared as goalies. Let's bring up one more picture here. This is, it's hard to imagine, you know, Here's the Stanley Cup with the Toronto Maple Leafs, the last time they won it, and Johnny Bauer, 42 years old, <laughs> gets to hoist the Stanley Cup there. But it does come at a price. He is really beaten up in this series, and here's what you say in the book. Uh, if Johnny Bauer returns in this series, this is after he's injured, the Toronto Club staff of physicians will be a sure pop cinch to win the 1967 Nobel Prize for Medicine, wrote the Globe and Mail's Jim Coleman at the time. Observing Bauer's limp, I can tell you what would happen to him if he were a horse on a well-supervised track. The track vet would issue orders to have Bauer humanely destroyed. Uh, he did manage somehow, I don't know how, to last another few years. He played till he was 45, eh? Yeah. How, did, he, did he want to retire at 45? I don't think Johnny ever wanted to retire. I think the, real, the reality of Johnny was that, in a way, his, perhaps even his, his attempt to never really discuss his age um, was that he, he wanted to go as long as he possibly could in this dream that he'd somehow managed to achieve. And Johnny, um, basically, basically his, his eyesight was failing. His, his body was, was, was not what it was. But he was 45 years old. I mean, it was exceptional just to... to Think about what he did in the NHL from a career that started when he was in his early 30s to his mid 40s. Now, let's That's remember, a, there's no modern training techniques. There's nothing. no modern nutrition. There's yeah. no. I mean, there's none of the stuff that keeps guys playing longer today, 50 years ago. Yeah. And and yet, look at him. And if you think of the wounds that he sustained on oh. his face, and and all, just it was. It's a it's a miracle in itself that Johnny got to that point. But Johnny himself wouldn't want to stop playing. So the day after he retired, he was back on the ice practicing with the Leafs because he signed on. Um, and, he, and he basically was with the Leafs until he was officially um, ret of retirement age at, at 65. He had an office with the Leafs. He was in various positions as a scout, as assistant coach later on. Um, and then uh, I think as, as anybody following the Leafs of late knows, uh, knows that Johnny stayed with the team basically until he died. Well, let's show the next picture because this really describes it. I think the people that know more recently Johnny Bauer recognize that guy. This is a guy who we should say 1976, he makes the Hall of Fame. And for the next four decades, 
he becomes the most beloved Leaf ever, I would say. He's showing up at games, he's signing autographs, he's doing charitable events, and he was doing this well into his 90s. Dan, how come? I mean, that's why, that's why um, I think Johnny is so special, because he, he never stopped being grateful for what the game had given him. And I think that always went back to his very humble roots in, in Saskatchewan. He, he at, ho at best, hoped to work for the railroad. He didn't really even dream of being in the NHL because that dream was, was way beyond something that he could have imagined. Um, when he was able to achieve it, I think Johnny was constantly grateful. It wasn't that he needed the spotlight or that he, you know, he, he was you know, arrogant or proud. It was that he loved to, to meet new fans and to talk to fans and to be there. And when, you know, when he's in, a, in an arena like that with that beautiful photo with, when he's addressing the crowd, I mean, it's a very moving photo. And I, and I think that it captures sort of this this gratitude, not just from what the fans were giving to him, but what he was giving back to the fans. The love on, I mean, on his face in that picture is yeah. just tremendous. Uh, as we said at the outset, two years ago, Boxing Day, he died. What did he die of? A pneumonia in the end. Um, and it was interesting because he was signing autographs right up until the weeks before he got sick. He, he would sit there and sign for every single person um, that came through. And this is a man who's just turned 93 years old, and, and he was sitting there graciously taking photographs, signing autographs, and and, uh, and just engaging with the people who, who loved him. They had a fantastic memorial service for him at, I guess, what is now the Scotiabank Arena. Was it called that back then? Might have been the Air Canada Centre then. I can't remember. Did you go to that? I wasn't actually at that. I was. It was It was um, the holidays, and, and sort of I was away. I, I remember watching the highlights of it, though, and on my, on my wall, I have a... Um, a picture that I received when I was a kid of, of Johnny Bauer um, from my aunt, and, and he had signed it to Danny, um, which was called when I was a kid. And I had a dream, I was a goalie and dreamed of playing in the NHL, and he'd signed it um, to me. And I remember um, watching the highlights of the memorial and then sort of looking at that painting and just mm -hmm. thinking about, like, why was it that I even cared about somebody that I never saw play? I, 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 I knew him only of him through the legend that he was. And, and I think that. That's what gripped me, was seeing that connection that somebody years after, decades after they play, could still have that kind of a hold on a fan base and on a game. Um, I think it was uniquely special. First game I ever went to in the NHL, December 1966, Johnny Bauer shuts out the Boston Bruins 3-0. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, this stuff you don't forget. Uh, where is he buried? So he's buried in, uh, in Mississauga near his, um, near his home where he and um, Nancy live together uh, in a very sort of normal suburban home next to Johnny Bauer Park where he used to go and pick up garbage because he was so honored that they, they named it after him that he took care of it like it was his own house uh, where he fed the birds and where, he walk, where, he, where he'd feed the dogs that would walk by. So it's very close to, to him there and he's buried in a, um, he was cremated in his, in his um, held in a, in, a, in a wall celebrating in all kinds of lives, all kinds of very important lives, but lives that are much less famous, and he's just uh, one of the many. What's on his headstone? So the headstone is, 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 is his name, um, and, and there, are no, there are no dates. So. No dates, no list of accomplishments, yeah. no... Yeah. That's him, eh? So modest. Just the, just the name, and I think that that's the, the... It encapsulates what he is. It's hard to, to take a period of time for Johnny Bauer and say this is, this is what Johnny meant, and this is, the, this is the time that his life existed. I think because of this sort of age uh, myth that sort of surrounded him, um, on top of all of that, he, he ends up being timeless. Hmm. As crazy as it is to say, I thought he'd never die. You know, I thought he'd go it, on and on and on. It felt shocking when he did die. It did, and, yeah. and, and when you think about it, he was 93 years old, and I think most people didn't, I mean, they might have thought about that, but they didn't really think of the reality of that, but he felt immortal. Yeah. I'm so glad you uh, put his story down on pages so that we can know it so much better. Bauer, a legendary life, and boy was it ever. Dan Robson, thanks so much, Dan. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.